U.S. President Joe Biden is wrapping up his trip to Europe for the NATO summit with a visit to the military alliance's newest member, Finland. Biden has arrived in Helsinki for meetings with Nordic leaders. Finland joined NATO in April, expanding the alliance's presence on Russia's doorstep. Sweden is also expected to become a member after Turkey dropped its opposition. But one country not joining NATO soon is Ukraine. The alliance's annual summit wrapped up on Wednesday with new pledges of weapons and ammunition and long-term security guarantees for Ukraine. President Zelensky left more upbeat than when he arrived. President Zelensky looks right at home at this first-of-its-kind NATO-Ukraine meeting. It's an upgrade in ties with the alliance, but far from the permanent seat at the table he's set his sights on. We understand that someone is really afraid of talking about our membership now because nobody is willing to have a world war, which is logical and understandable. Ukraine is fighting and we truly understand that we can't be NATO members as long as the war continues. That's because bringing Kyiv into the fold now would spark direct war between NATO and Russia. So Ukraine sought details on how and when the country can join in future. But Germany and the US remained cautious and the alliance avoided any official talk of timelines. Still, Ukraine won't go home empty-handed. Since this war began, I've stood with President Zelensky as I just spent about an hour with him, both in Washington, in Kyiv, in, in, in Hiroshima, and now in Vilnius, to declare to the world what I say again. We will not waver. We will not waver. I mean that. Our commitment to Ukraine will not weaken. We will stand for liberty and freedom today, tomorrow, and for as long as it takes. The G7 group of wealthy democracies announced plans for new long-term security assurances for Kyiv. They pledged to keep up arms shipments, to train more troops and to help Ukraine with reforms and recovery. These security guarantees are made up of medium-term, short-term and long-term measures. This is not only military support for the right to self-defense through our delivery of military supplies, but also economic guarantees for the reconstruction of infrastructure. G7 nations also say in the event of future Russian aggression, they'll offer swift and sustained security assistance. Moscow dubbed the declaration a dangerous mistake, but Kyiv called it a much-needed success, taking Ukrainians one step closer to victory, even if the path toward NATO membership still looks long and winding. Let's get the view now from Kyiv. We are joined by DW's Nick Connolly. Nick, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, he went from calling out NATO for its uncertainty and lack of timeline for potential NATO membership, hailing what he called a significant security victory for Ukraine. Why the change in tone over the past days? I think, Sarah, he didn't have many other options left, and this was also about papering over the cracks in ties with Western allies. We saw some real frustration with Ukraine and Zelensky's very open and emotional uh, social media post calling the declaration absurd. We saw the British defence minister calling for more gratitude from the Ukrainian side. We saw uh, briefings from the US side, even Joe Biden telling Zelensky in front of the cameras that he was stuck with him. And uh, basically, there was a sense that from the Ukrainian side, they need to row back to make sure there wasn't more diplomatic damage and to make sure that, you know, in the long haul, there is that willingness to keep going. I think this was a huge disappointment for the Ukrainian side. We even heard Volodymyr Zelensky in the run-up to this saying he wouldn't turn up in Vilnius if he didn't get crucial and kind of concrete steps towards membership. That roadmap hasn't happened. Lots of people here in Kiev saying that Ukraine, for all the promises, isn't significantly closer to NATO than it was before this summit. But you know, he is in a position where these are the only options on the table, the only allies in town, and he's just having to live with it. The summit um, happening against the backdrop of new attacks on Kiev. Will the Ukrainian public and, and those fighting for the country agree with Zelensky that he returns from Vilnius having achieved anything? So what he has brought 
are promises of more weapons. Germany is pledging more Patriot anti-aircraft, anti-missile systems, uh, more munitions for Ukraine's counteroffensive coming from different NATO countries. So there is kind of hard and fast uh, equipment material coming in the next few months. But if you look further, there's still this worry here in Ukraine that most Western countries still aren't willing to call out Russia's bluff, that after a year and a half of fighting here, they're still more worried about destabilizing Russia or provoking Russia than they are about seeing Ukraine win on the battlefield. So that uncertainty remains. And there's a real sense here that as long as Ukraine isn't given that kind of hard and fast path to NATO, that ambiguity just encourages Russia to keep on going in the hope that you know, maybe a new government in Washington or uh, new governments in Europe will lose interest in Ukraine and allow Russia to expand its influence here in this part of the world. Nick Connolly in Kiev. Nick, thank you. NDW's Konstantin Eggert has been following the summit in Vilnius and the reaction coming in from the Kremlin. So uh, within hours of this NATO summit ending, Russia's foreign ministry was accusing NATO of pursuing Cold War schemes and escalation in Ukraine. Apart from words, what other reaction is to be expected from the Kremlin? Well, Sarah, it is a boilerplate Russian reaction, uh, which you would expect in such circumstances. In terms of... Uh, doing anything about it. I'm certain that the Kremlin has only one plan, uh, to continue striking Ukrainian targets, to continue basically terrorizing Ukrainian civilians. Uh, that is actually what uh, Putin was doing and will continue to do in this, in, in, in this particular setting. I think, and here kind of it links to what uh, Nick said, from Kiev. Uh, I think to some extent some elements uh, in the Kremlin or maybe Putin himself will be emboldened by the results of the summit that really did not significantly move Ukraine closer to NATO. Uh, so expect another reaction. Um, a ball uh, on Russian state TV channels saying that uh, uh, NATO is selling Ukraine down the river. Among other aims, NATO members set out to demonstrate unity. How successful was that? Well, I think we've heard about the what, what the British Defence Secretary said. We've heard about uh, actually Deutsche Welle sources um, are telling us here in Vilnius that uh, there were definitely um, even sharper exchanges between, let us say, Ukrainian and U.S. delegations uh, without Zelensky and Biden present about arms deliveries and about Ukrainian demands. So I would say that although unity. Well, I mean, definitely there is unity, but it's not uh, unity without problems. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, next at next year's uh, Washington summit uh, uh, of NATO, uh, these problems will resurface and probably some of them will be even a bit more serious. DW is Konstantin Egger. Thank you. And let's get more now. We are joined by Marina Henke, an international relations analyst, for more on this. So Zelensky has been promised full support, even without the timetable for membership in NATO that he had hoped for. What sort of signal do you think that sends? So Zelensky wanted more, there can be no doubt, but there was just no consensus among the allies. I think there were two reasons for that. The first one was that if there was such an immediate guarantee that Ukraine would enter once the war stops, Russia would have an incentive to actually not never stop fighting so that you know an end would never occur and NATO accession of Ukraine would never occur. The second reason was, and it was particularly voiced by the United States, that uh, Ukraine was actually a pretty corrupt country prior to the war. And uh, so they wanted to see that the political reforms were actually implemented in Ukraine before such a guarantee okay. or, or NATO membership could actually happen. So I think, you know, like this was really pushed, but, you know, Ukraine still got something. And I think an important uh, factor that, you know, like shouldn't be ignored is that the member action plan was waived for Ukraine. So all um, previous NATO members that acceded to the alliance after the end of the Cold War had to uh, passed through a pretty elaborate uh, process. And uh, so, you know, NATO doesn't um, doesn't uh, want Ukraine to go through the same process. So actually, that could be a very speedy accession. So, but of course, first a consensus in the ally in the eyes that to be created. 
I'd just like uh, you to address some of the criticism that has come come out. Because so, some critics, they are slamming the summit outcome. Um, and I'm quoting here, saying that it screams of fear and insecurity from every word. That's one uh, former U.S. ambassador to Germany framing it in those terms. Another uh, saying that it is a failed opportunity. Are allies insecure? Did you get the sense that there was some fear about, you know, perhaps how Russia might react if Ukraine were to be given a timeline to join NATO when the war ends? So I don't think it was driven out of fear. Uh, I think that was a pretty strong consensus that uh, everything needs to be done that Ukraine can win this war. And here, by the way, the alliance has changed dramatically. So I think the fear of Russia lashing out, I would say, was much greater last year than actually today. So I have never seen NATO more convinced that Russia needs to be defeated than right now. But, you know, there is, as I said, there is this kind of uncertainty also concerning Ukraine, frankly. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, how will Ukraine develop after this war? And then, of course, from a U.S. perspective right now, they are still the one who really, uh, you know, need to defend Ukraine. And the European allies are not at that point where they actually share the burden equally. So I think also for the United States, there was a clear message sent to the European allies to say, if you really want to have Ukraine inside of NATO, you need to step up and then Ukraine needs to be protected, but not just with U.S. means, but also with European means. So a very clear message to the Europeans saying uh, for future membership of Ukraine, you need to be ready to also be doing, you know, the heavy lifting. Okay. Where does the alliance stand right now? Um, where does all of this leave it? Because we had Baltic states, Poland, for example, pushing especially hard for this promise to invite Ukraine once the war um, ends. But, you know, others were pushing back, for example, the United States. Are you seeing signs of cracks in the alliance in terms of, of approach and, and how things move forward? So the alliance published its uh, first comprehensive defense plan since the end of the Cold War. 4,000 pages with very detailed analysis of where actually, you know, like the necessary resources need to be invested to defend NATO in the east, in the north, and also in the south. And I think the, you know, big uh, question now on the table is, will the European allies step up to the plate and actually implement this plan? And, and there I still see the big question mark. I'm not entirely sure whether uh, all the NATO countries can meet those 2%. But um, when it comes to a consensus right now that Ukraine needs okay. to be supported, I think this consensus is there. We have to leave it there. Uh, Marina Henka, international relations analyst, we thank you so much for joining us to share that expertise. Thank you.